Hello, hello, welcome to the video. Jurassic Park was, and still is, the most popular dinosaur movie and dinosaur movie franchise ever since the first film all the way back in 1993. Since we're now in the year 2023, that means Jurassic Park is now 30 years old. Originally, I was planning on doing an accuracy review of the film since it's turning 30 years old this year, but I think it's safe to say everyone has done that, no matter what film's birthday it is when they upload their videos. So, since I want to do something special to celebrate, I thought, you know what, gotta get creative. You see, for those who don't know, the film is actually based on a book by the now deceased best-selling author Michael Crichton. This book is probably one of his most notable works, but I've noticed that when it comes to Jurassic Park, there's never any attention given beyond differences between it and the film. So I was sat at my computer thinking that since this book started everything, if I'm gonna do something special for Jurassic Park's 30th anniversary, I should review the book's scientific accuracy. Especially since for my birthday I got numerous more dinosaur books to add to my collection and improve the quality of my videos. One thing I should state before I do, which you might have guessed from the title, is that the book is split into seven major sections dubbed iterations, and then you have the prologue and epilogue at the beginning and end. This video will only be analysing the prologue and iteration one, and the rest will be saved for their own videos at some point. And now on with the video. In the prologue before iteration one, we are introduced to a character known as Roberta or Bobby Carter a doctor from Chicago now spending some time in Costa Rica. The scene describes a lot of rain pouring down on the hospital and her assistant, Manuel, says to her that he can hear something besides the rain. This sound turns out to be that of the rotor blades of a Sikorsky helicopter with a blue line and the words InGen Construction on its side. InGen supposedly building a resort on one of the offshore islands. Roberta rushes out to meet them as they land on the sandy beach near the hospital as they call out for a doctor to help them. She asks them what happened as she escorts them to the hospital and they reply that the young teenager in the stretch of their carrying, no older than 18, had fell over and got run over by a backhoe. When they get him inside, she inspects the wounds and says that they look more like a mauling. When she questions one of the men, Ed Regus, about this, she gets a little suspicious since he seems a bit on edge about it, despite the fact that, as she thought to herself, if they were using inexperienced local men to build the resort, you'd expect there'd be a lot of work-related injuries. As she continued to inspect the body and found no signs of dirt contamination, which is something to expect from being run over by a backhoe on a tropical island with no roads, all she could find in the wounds was this weird, slippery substance that she believed to be saliva from some form of animal, which Crichton describes having a rotten stench, a smell of death and decay. Later, she'd notice the boy's hands showed marks similar to those as if the boy was trying to fight off an animal, having numerous cuts and bruises. She continued to inspect the wounds, finding no signs of crushed bone or anything, strengthening her belief it was an animal attack. She forced Regus and the other men out of the room so she could take pictures. As she took pictures of the room, the boy began to mutter something. Raptor, he said. Lo, sir, raptor. Manuel froze and refused to continue cleaning the wounds as Roberta had instructed him to. He explained that what the kid said relates to a monster known as the Hoopia, which in the Jurassic Park novel universe are said to be night ghosts that steal children, originally living up in the mountains but have since moved to offshore islands. As she inspected the wounds and pleaded for Manuel to continue cleaning, the boy sat up on the table and began to vomit tremendous amounts of blood before falling onto the floor and passing away, despite Roberta's attempts to save him. Ed Regus came in, but turned away after seeing the mess, with his co-workers taking the body away back to the helicopter before him and the workers flew off somewhere else, presumably to one of the offshore islands. After they left, Roberta would notice her camera had disappeared. Roberta would also later look up the word raptor in her Spanish dictionary, despite Manuel saying it isn't a Spanish word, and she'd also ask a local midwife attending to a woman in labour about it. In the Spanish dictionary, she got ravisher, or abductor, whilst the midwife, Elena, said it means a man who comes and steals a baby, and that they shouldn't be talking about that or anything relating to the hoop here while a man is, a man is in labour. Oh 
god. That's going in the bloopers section. In the Spanish dictionary, she got ravisher or abductor, whilst the midwife, Elena, said it means a man who comes and steals a baby, and that they shouldn't be talking about that or anything relating to the hoopier while a woman is in labour. Out of curiosity, Roberta would also look it up in her English dictionary, which simply said, bird of prey. The reason I bring this scene up at the beginning is because this, presumably, is Michael Crichton attempting to nudge readers slowly and surely into believing the idea that birds are dinosaurs. This idea was originally mocked and was controversial, but thanks to studies published, most famously by John Ostrom and his student Robert T. Backer during the dinosaur renaissance of the 60s and 70s, this idea would be more and more well supported and is now widely accepted as fact. This means that dinosaurs didn't actually die off during the mass extinction 66 million years ago, but are actually still alive today and are still one of the most successful and diverse groups of animals to have ever evolved, so I will give Crichton points for this. Jurassic Park, as I remember Darren Nash saying in Dinopedia, incorporated a fair bit of what was at the time modern paleontology. This includes not only the idea that birds are dinosaurs, but also that dinosaurs are warm-blooded or endothermic. This will also be brought up later if I remember correctly, and I'll talk more about endothermy versus ectothermy in dinosaurs next time it's uh, brought up in the story, which I believe is iteration 2 or 3. Also, as a quick side note, this means the wedge-tailed eagle is the first dinosaur I ever did a video about on this channel, and I have, upon realising this, added it to my dinosaurs playlist of videos. And now we move on to iteration 1. At the earliest drawings of the fractal curve, few clues to the underlying mathematical structure will be seen. Ian Malcolm the first chapter of Iteration 1 opens up with us being introduced to Mike Bowman, a real estate developer from Dallas on vacation in San Jose, Costa Rica with his wife Ellen and daughter Tina. Ellen nagged him about the vacation for months and upon getting there he found out she had a plastic surgery appointment. After convincing her away from it, they'd spend some time on a beach to at least enjoy the vacation somewhat, with Ellen and Mike staying back near the car preparing food, and Tina running down the beach. Tina takes a break and rests under some shade after her mother yells at her about not having any sunscreen on. Hoping to find some form of animal, she looks around at little bird tracks she found in the sand, and sees a little lizard come out of the bushes. This lizard stands upright on its hind legs and is green with brown stripes on its back. The little girl extends her arm out to it, palm flat and open, showing she doesn't have any food. And then the one foot tall animal hops up onto her hand and runs up her arm, interrupting her parents' conversation as she lets out a loud scream. If this scene sounds familiar to you, that's because, or at least from what I know, it would be used as the beginning of the second Jurassic Park film, The Lost World, Jurassic Park. Except it would be modified for the film for it to be people on a cruise ship stumbling across the island known as Site B or Isla Sauna instead of a family having a vacation on Costa Rica. And of course there would be more than one little lizard attacking the girl. This animal in the book is meant to be the animal Procopsognathus triassicus. According to Dinosaur Facts and Figures, the theropods and other dinosaur forms, the Procopsognathus specimen SMNS12591 has a hip height of 28cm or about 11 inches, weighs roughly 1.3 kilograms or 2.86 pounds, and is a metre long or 3.28 feet. This means when compared to this specimen, the Procoxognathus in Jurassic Park is slightly smaller than the holotype specimen of the animal, perhaps being a juvenile. However, one thing that is described is that when it hops onto her hand, she could feel the weight of it pressing her hand down, so I wouldn't be surprised if that's roughly the same weight as the specimen I just referenced. Also, it's described looking like a lizard, when going off of the illustration shown in Theropods and Other Dinosaur Forms, it should have some form of protofeathers or feather-like filaments on its body. And according to the Jurassic Park fandom website, the Procopsognathus in the novel has five fingers, when in reality they only had four, though the illustration in Theropods and Other Dinosaur Forms shows only three. The final thing I want to note is that, again, we get the comparison drawn between birds and dinosaurs. Crichton describes Tina finding what she believes to be bird-like footprints in the sand, but then notices that the Procopsognathus leaves the same footprints in the sand. He even describes it bobbing its head like a bird and chirping. 
However, I don't know how plausible it is that dinosaurs chirped like birds, even after checking out Edge's video on the voice box of Pinacosaurus that was discovered. Anyway, I think we should all give some praise to Crichton, helping to show how similar birds and dinosaurs are, since quite a few people probably even now, still interpret dinosaurs as these crocodilian things like what's shown in 65. The second chapter is a continuation where Tina receives treatment for the bites she got from the Procopsognathus with Dr. Martin Guritiez, based on the description of height and its upright walk, believing it to be a Basiliscus amaratus, which she had just had an allergic reaction to. The Bowman family and him have a slight debate over this, leaving the Doctor slightly confused about it for now. I should note that Basiliscus amaratus doesn't actually exist and is a fictional species of Basilisk lizard made up by Crichton for Jurassic Park. Also, as another side note, if I remember correctly, the real animal is known as the Jesus Christ lizard due to its ability to run on water which is one of the funniest names I've ever heard for, for an animal, only being beaten out by Cock of the Rock. The third chapter doesn't really contain much to go over. What happens is the Dr. Martin Gurutiers goes hunting for strange animals just in case Tina did actually stumble across a new species. However, he finds nothing and right as he's about to set off for home before it gets dark, he sees a howler monkey in a tree eating a lizard the same colour as the one that bit Tina. After shooting it with a tranquilizer gun, he sends the half-eaten remains to an expert in lizard taxonomy named Edward H. Simpson from the University of Columbia. After that, the chapter simply called New York is the same story of not much to go over with lab technicians running viral tests on the sample given, but do not make any attempt to verify the specimen as an unknown species or not. They do not include this in the facts sheet they give Gurutiers. The newborn baby from the woman going into labour mentioned earlier near the beginning also falls victim to free Procompsognathus, with the midwife Elena her, shooing them away from the corpse and out into the rain before realising what had happened. Crichton again draws a comparison to birds, describing them having three-toed feet and chirping like birds which originally led Elena to think birds had visited the newborn child, a sign of good luck in Costa Rica. In the final chapter of Iteration 1, Elena reports that the baby died of Sudden Infant Death Syndrome, or SIDS, in order to not get into trouble for leaving the infant unguarded, no one questions her about it. People analysing the saliva of the Procopsognathus also found it to have a primitive form of neurotoxin similar to that of cobra venom, and that the animal has what is basically a trademark on it saying genetic engineering was involved. However, they don't pursue this any further due to the presumption of it most likely being a lab contaminant, as Crichton describes. As far as I know, there is no supporting evidence for dinosaurs having venom. There was one dinosaur I can't remember the name of debated to have venom, but paleontologists such as Dr. Thomas R. Holtz Jr. aren't convinced by it, despite claims of evidence for it by the Chinese researcher who proposed the idea. Getting back to the story, a character by the name of Alice Levin stumbles upon the remains of the Procopsognathus and says to one of the technicians who studied it that it's a dinosaur, that the drawing done by Tina that came with it is clearly depicting a dinosaur, and that they should send the remains to a dinosaur or expert. The technician, Dr. Richard Stone, says it's not a dinosaur and says that they are not in any way sending it to anyone until Dr. Simpson arrives in about a month or so. And that ends iteration 1. I hope you enjoyed this video and let me know if you want me to continue on, especially since in the next couple of iterations we get more stuff to go over, such as the physiology of dinosaurs, which gives me a good reason to read the complete dinosaur second edition and the dinosaurus second edition I got for my birthday recently. Anyway, I'll see you next time I upload. Goodbye for now.